Now the last set of algebra techniques that we're going to talk about here in this section are just going to be some of the important trig identities that we should be aware of. Remember that this first identity that's listed here is our really famous Pythagorean identity. And if there's one identity that you need to really know, it's this guy. Now, of course, we have already talked about this semester how I can take an identity like this and derive these other identities by either dividing everything on the left and right by a sine squared or dividing everything on the left and right by a cosine squared. So if you don't remember the other two, that's fine. I still don't remember them. Uh, I just know the first one and I recreate the others every time I need them. However, there are some uh, additional formulas that can be useful, which are these double or half angle formulas. And so these can be helpful from time to time as well. Let's take a look at how we can use some of these identities as well as just some basic algebra techniques to answer questions seven through nine. So let's take a look here at number seven. Notice again, I have an indefinite integral, so I'm just gonna look for a final antiderivative for this function. Um, well, again, this is really difficult because I'll see at first I have a product here and I can't find the antiderivative of a product by doing the antiderivative of each thing. That's not okay. That's not a derivative rule that I'm undoing. But what I could notice maybe right away is that I do have a product here. And so I could go ahead and maybe start by distributing this front value of the secant of x at least just to see what happens. Now, if I was to go ahead and do this, notice that I would end up with a secant squared of x plus a secant of x tangent of x. So if I was to go ahead and try to find the antiderivative of each of these pieces, I would see that the antiderivative for the secant squared is actually very well known to me. That's just the tangent of x. And the antiderivative of secant tangent is just the secant function. Of course, to make this as general as possible, I would put at the back a plus C. So now let's take a look at example number eight. Can I evaluate the antiderivative of tangent squared? All right, well, I don't remember any derivative rules with, or that gave me the answer of tangent squared. So what else can I do with this? Well, there's obviously a couple things. I could rewrite this as sine squared over cosine squared and maybe try to find something to do with that. But I might also notice that, wait, I had an identity right here on the second line that says that the tangent squared of x plus one is equal to the secant squared of x. Well, if I just subtract one from both sides, I could see that the tangent squared is going to be equal to the secant squared minus one. So I'm gonna make use of that here. The tangent squared of x is equal to the secant squared of x minus one. And since now this is uh, two items being subtracted, I can go ahead and use my difference rule kind of in reverse and find the antiderivative of each piece, which is really easy here again, because the antiderivative of secant squared is my tangent function. Antiderivative of my one is just going to be x. And to make this as general as possible, I add plus c. So this is good. So let's take a look now at something like example number nine. The complexity is continuing to ramp up here a little bit. The biggest difference here is that I'll notice that this is going to be a definite integral. And so I know that I'm looking for an area underneath this curve. And so one of the first things that I'll have to check is if my function is continuous. So let's see, note that I have a function here that's like f of theta. It's the cosine of theta over the sine squared of theta. And my question is, is this continuous from pi over four to pi over two? Well, as long as my sine doesn't ever turn into the value of zero on this interval, then I'm okay. So where does my sine function actually spit out zero? Well, that would be at values of like zero or two pi or four pi, or maybe over here at a value of pi or three pi or five pi. So going from the angle of pi over four up to pi over two, I'm never gonna kind of cross over any of these bad spots. So I can definitely say that this here is going to be continuous on the interval from pi over four to pi over two. And so we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus part two or 
I guess we never really put the O in there before, but we just said FTC P2. Okay, so since we can go ahead and do that, let's go ahead and start to try to write out our integral here to kind of see how we would actually begin to work with this, because it is a little bit messy. All right, so, hmm, how can I work with this? Because this is pretty darn ugly. Well, again, there's a lot of different ways that I might be able to try to work with it, but maybe here's one way. Maybe I could take my fraction and I could split my fractions. But notice here, instead of splitting with addition and subtraction, I'm going to split with multiplication. I'm going to go ahead and leave a 1 over a sine theta in the denominator and a cosine of theta over a sine of theta in this second fraction. Now when I do this, of course, I can rewrite each of these different factors here. 1 over the sine of theta is the same as the cosecant of theta. Cosine over the sine is going to end up being the cotangent of theta. And so really, this is equivalent to asking, can I find an antiderivative now for my cosecant of theta times cotangent of theta? Do I know any derivative rules that would have given me this as an answer? Well, I actually don't, but I know something pretty darn close. If I was taking the derivative here of the cosecant of theta, my answer would have been negative cosecant cotangent. So if I just put an extra negative on here, I should be good. And now I can just go ahead and evaluate this from pi over 4 to pi over 2. So let's see what that would look like. That would be a negative cosecant of pi over 2, and then minus negative cosecant at pi over 4. So I can see here this is going to be the same thing as just evaluating 1 over the sine at each of these values. So the sine at pi over 2 is going to just be uh, 1. So I'm going to get negative 1 over 1. The sine at pi over 4 is going to be square root of 2 over 2. And so I can actually go ahead and just simplify this down to look like the following. Notice here in the second fraction, I just multiplied by the reciprocal. And actually here, if I wanted to, it's not necessary, but I could do it. If I wanted to rationalize my denominator, multiplying by root 2 over root 2, you could see that I could get down to a final answer of minus 1 plus a square root of 2. And so here is the area under this curve on the given interval. So in this section, we've seen a lot of different things, a lot of different ways that we can manipulate what we are given initially with algebra or with trig identities so that we can more easily see derivative rules that we recognize from earlier in the semester. Now, of course, this is going to be something that's going to take a lot of practice. And so I, I encourage you to go ahead and take a look at the worksheet associated with this section so you can try to rehearse uh, the ideas that we've covered here in this video and feel really confident as we continue to move forward.